Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about about faith tonight. I said that I would. We talked a few weeks ago about discouragement. We talked last time I talked about about, uh, leaving the house of fear. And I want to talk to you about faith. I, first of all, a confession. I um, have become increasingly over the last five years particularly, a little bit over the last ten, become more and more disillusioned uh, with Christendom, as is the bigger term for, for church circles, um, with the whole setup, and, and for those of you who understand the term, um, uh, increasingly so with what some of you would know as evangelicalism for reasons we can always discuss. I'm very open to converse about those things. Um, and um, the prophetic side of me sees things of where I believe things are heading, and they're not always easy in the beginning because prophetic lets you see things that people are not seeing and know things that people are not knowing at the time. And uh, yeah, the future is good, but across the world there's a big transition and the divide is growing increasingly to show that there is a difference between one thing and the other thing and I'll talk to you about that some other time, now is not, not the time to, uh, to talk about that. However, um, one of the things that concerns me and I've had a personal experience to look at this is the incredible lack of integrity in what is called the body of Christ. Now, some of you might think, what are you talking about? Well, you know, I'm on the cutting edge of that. I meet a lot of people. I go in a lot of churches. I talk to a lot of ministers and uh, have been around a long time. And um, there are values that concern me because they are not, they're not become part of the fabric of people's lives. They're only part of the fabric of their belief or what they think is their belief, but not part of the life. The, the word, the word, um, Uh, Integrity, of course, comes from the word integral. And uh, it means to have an integrated life. It means that you cannot separate the aspects of your life. There isn't church and, and, you know, work or or spiritual and, 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 and secular. That There is an integration. And what it means is that our value system uh, is consistent. But I've said to you before that, that, you know nothing about forgiveness until you have to forgive something you don't want to forgive. And, and so, to say that you understand forgiveness is arrogance until that. So, there, there are some things I, I can't confess to having as part of my true value system because I've not had to face them. I said also the thing about faithfulness, which is a big issue. It's interesting how many people are faithful so long as they get what they want, whether it's in marriage, in friendships, uh, you know, in associations, in church, but the moment it's not quite going the way they want, suddenly faithfulness is an option. I am not faithful. And um, these are problems in society as well as the church, but the sad thing is that very often there is little difference between how society walks in forgiveness, faithfulness, and those kind of values, and how the church does. In fact, in some ways, people outside the church are often more consistent in their friendship and faithfulness and forgiveness than than people within the community we call the church, which I think is incredibly sad. And uh, it's something that we we should be conscious to do, to do something about. One of those those values um, is is the issue of faith. Uh, Most of us don't have anything that we actually have to have faith for or about, because we can figure out how we can resolve what it is that we are going through, or how we can get the provision, or how we can change the situation, 
And uh, we talk about we believe in God, but actually if you were to strip everything away, we're not believing God at all because our minds have already figured out how this can possibly happen. Now, I'm very grateful uh, when that does happen and, 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 and there is a gratefulness to God expressed, which rightly so, you know, because all things are working together for our good if we love God, and all good gifts around us come from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning, the Bible says. So I'm always very appreciative when, when we give thanks to God for things that happen, but most of that stuff, if you took God out of the picture, could have worked out or been worked out anyway, and that therefore becomes the challenge. So the question is, and, 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 and in the Gospels there's a verse, when he comes, when it talks about Jesus returning, will he find faith in the earth? Now, I don't think it was to do with will he find the Christian faith in the church. It wasn't about that at all because there was no Christian faith at that time and Jesus wasn't a Christian. So will he find faith in the earth was about will he find people who have found a dimension in which they live that is not bound within the walls of reason, but actually functions in a different dimension of power and possibility. And so faith is something the Bible talks about. And uh, what is interesting is, is in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, it's not on the screen, you don't need to see it. I've talked about this verse before and could learn something talked about this verse before. Isn't it interesting how some people don't think there's anything they can learn that would help them? It bothers me. Anyway. Okay. So, um, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. These three remain. Faith, hope, love. I've said to you before, but it's very important we visit this, that once you put the word remain in there, it means that something has been taken away. So if these three remain, faith, hope, love, and the greatest is love, what it means is that everything else that we encounter, practice, involve ourselves in, desire, look for, is just stuff. Now into that, it's very interesting because Paul who writes the letter to the Corinthians includes in that spiritual gifts, prophecies, wisdom, knowledge, all kinds of stuff in chapter 12 and chapter 14 but in chapter 13 declares it might be important stuff and it might be good stuff and it might be useful stuff, but in the context of the bigger picture, it's just stuff. But most of the church is striving after being good at the stuff, right? All the peripheral stuff, rather than focusing on where do we sit in the context of our faith, how dynamic is our faith? How unmovable is our trust? How positive is our hope? And how deep is our love? So there's one thing about love that I've learned, that where true love exists, you can't walk away because love won't let you. You understand what I'm saying? So some of these values, we become exposed that, that we are transient in them because we are looking for experiences rather than reality. And even in the context of love, many people fall in and out of love, which was never really love in that sense. It was what the, what the psychologists call limerence because we're actually looking for experiences rather than reality. Now, again, I'm going to be pretty hard-hitting here, but in a church setup, in a Christian community setup, that can be just the same that what people are looking for is experiences rather than reality. And so trying to find the place that gives us the most acute experience rather than where is this reality that's going to be truth that will actually set me free because if I move from one love to another love, I will move from that love to another love and I'll move from that love to another love because it's based on this, on this what the psychologists call limerence which is that, that butterfly feeling that, oh, this is amazing, this is so wonderful which any of you that have been married for a, a year or two, or a year or 10, or a year or 30 or 40, will know that it's not butterflies and goosebumps that keep a marriage together. It's love that keeps a marriage together, because they're actually not that about the love. 
they're actually about the emotional fulfillment, what, 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 what is called the, the um, what does Scott Peck call delaying gratification. They're about instant gratification that we grow through. Now, um, if God's love for us was based on our performance and how our performance makes him feel, then God's love wouldn't be worth much because let's just speak for me. My performance would indicate that his love should be separated from me because I would not be worthy of his love. But love is not given because of worth. Love is not given because of feeling. Love is given because it's love. So I'm not here to talk about love, but I've just talked about love uh, because I want to make this point that that for all of us in all of our lives, these three things are the three things that Paul says. If you can get these right, but they are not the ones that we focus on. We focus more on feeling-based things rather than these realities of faith, hope, and love of which the greatest is love. So, of course, in there, faith is one of those three things. And um, without something inside us that reaches for the seemingly impossible... We remain bound in a world of reason. And all our solutions simply become the result of personal action and good planning. So like I said, I'm very delighted when things work out. But I've had to ask myself in my own life, I've, I've sat outside on our patio and thought, is there anything in my life that I am believing for that requires the level of faith that I can't make it happen by any other means than something outside of myself and probably something outside of this world, which is God. And I had to think, well, probably not really because I'm figuring stuff out. And then we wonder why we don't shift very much. Now, I'm going to talk about how some people can get a little bit of guilt over this because you can be in a situation like dear old Betty Wright with... Chris, you know, praying and believing, and Chris doesn't get healed, and Chris died, and this is not about the condemnation of that, because actually it's never about the result, it's about where our hearts sit before God, and what God sees in our heart that actually pleases Him. Some of the other stuff, we think we know better than God, and we've got to just leave some of that stuff and say, actually, if He's perfect in all of His ways, I don't believe all that nonsense, God needed another angel, or God saw this child and it was a beautiful rose and God needed it in his God, what nonsense, that's most unhelpful stuff. But I do believe there comes a point where we have to release our understanding into God's understanding and say, okay, sometimes, sometimes things didn't work out like we want, but guess what, sometimes things do. And sometimes those miracles become what we were looking for and that's what I want to shoot for. In, uh, in our belief. Now, it, it's interesting that the only two people that Jesus declared great in their faith was a Roman centurion and a Canaanite woman from a region called Syrophoenicia. So he never declared about the people who had the greatest access to what we would call Scripture and the greatest knowledge of that Scripture and who had all the practices to go along with that knowledge and possession of that scripture, never said about a single one of them that their faith was great. That would suggest to me that sometimes the deeper we get into religious knowledge, the harder it is to truly express the kind of faith that God is looking for. Its simplicity is not based on my works, and it's not based on my efforts, and it's not based on my knowledge. It's all based on his love and his generosity and his kindness. And somehow this Roman and this Canaanite connected with something that Jesus said, great is your faith. So that says something to me about, particularly about people like me. I'm steeped in in, in this whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm steeped in schooling, in scripture. I'm steeped in in the traditions of my fathers, which some of them helpful, but, but, but they can actually be the very thing that prevents us from being real. How many of you think the Pharisees were real? How many of you think they were genuine in their expression of their, 
godliness. In fact, Jesus said, he used a word. Anybody know what the word was he used about them? You are hypocrites. Now, they weren't hypocrites because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of access to truth. They were hypocrites because that truth did not translate into a manifestation of what they said they believed that was meaningful, okay? So it became more of a club. It became a religious club. All about feelings and watching you. And of course, Jesus wasn't welcome, which I find very fascinating. I'm totally convinced that the vast majority of those who follow the religion that bears his name would not have liked the real Jesus. Convinced. I don't think Jesus would last five weeks in most churches. I'm serious. Some of you need to think this through. Think how many people, by the time Jesus had finished sharing what he shared, were still attached to him. Even the ones very closest to him thought, oh, we're not that sure. And when he's taken away, they're not with him at the cross. They're not supporting him. They've all deserted him. And it takes a series of events after the resurrection to just get these few to rekindle their belief and their faith. Because they, they couldn't grasp or understand the real Jesus. Now, the problem is we make the same mistake that that the Jewish Pharisees and teachers of the law made them. We think that because of our knowledge of Scripture, the New Testament, that we would spot him and we would be okay. But they thought because of their knowledge of the Old Testament that they would spot him and be okay. And they didn't. And so they got rid of him. Our understanding of the New Testament, which again is another completely, another debate because there is so much of the New Testament that has been deculturalized from what it was written, when it was written, who it was written to, and retranslated into 20th and 21st century thinking. Most of the key, the word is doctrines, doctrinal beliefs, particularly in evangelicalism, are from at the latest the, er, the, the, at the earliest, the late 19th century, most of them the 20th century. So when we talk about orthodoxy, most of those beliefs, I can show you who brought them in and how they came in, were issues that one has to wonder whether they truly represent and reflect what the gospel is really about. And so it's a challenge to us. You know, I, I, I could stand here and say it, but I would recognize him. I, I can't say that I would recognize him or like him. I, d I don't know whether Jesus might be too much for me when he starts coming in and saying things like, drink my blood and eat my body or you can have no part in me. Which was a very interesting statement if you wanted to lose a crowd, which which he did lose a crowd. Whether he would come in here and say, you guys are like open tombs, you look wonderful on the outside, you dress beautiful, you're so colorful and your smiles, and you look as butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, but how would we handle that? How, how would we take that kind of expression of Jesus? Because, because the other fascinating thing is, as many of you know, or if you read your Bible accurately, you will understand, is that Jesus never seemed to have harsh words for people who were getting it wrong. All his harsh words were to the people who thought they were getting it right. And maybe there's a Jesus lesson there that, that the problem is when we think we're getting it right, we're probably in more danger than when we know we're getting it wrong. And that's not an excuse for getting it wrong. It's not a reason to get it wrong, but it is a wonderful expression that this kind of love works with people who figured out how many times we're actually getting it wrong and that God still loves us and God still holds us and he's still our father and he's close to us. So all these things are, are critical. So, so in trying to put some perspective on the importance of faith in the whole scheme of things, the person who wrote the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, he said this in Hebrews 11 verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. That means that he is who he says he is. 
and that he rewards those who, who earnestly or diligently seek him. Now, I, d I don't want to break this down fully, yet, except I do want to focus in on some of the questions that this poses, one of them being that God can be pleased. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, many of you know, love has got nothing to do with being pleased. So this is not a question about God's love. Any of you that have ever had kids or been in a relationship will know that very often you're not pleased. But that does not impinge upon what love really is. But it does impinge upon how the flow within the relationship works. And I do believe that there is a flow within the relationship with God that needs to work. It's a flow of something that opens up, which begins to give us access to a dimension that we do not have outside of that flow. So we are loved by God, but I want to have access to the flow that comes from God, which is, I think, what it calls that, that, that pleasing God. When God is pleased, there is something about faith that makes God pleased. There's something that connects with the inside of Him. Now, um, we know from, again, psychological studies that that uh, all of us have different ways in which we experience love and ways that we give love. So, so the same thing doesn't work for everybody. You know, if you, if, you, if you want a person's undivided attention, you know, roses or a watch is not going to do it, okay? Because it's like, I don't want your stupid roses, I want your undivided attention. However, if you're a person that thinks gifts are what speak to you, for example, about a person's love, then roses and watches and those things will be, oh, he really loves me because look at what he gives me. So we're all, we're all extremely different in, in how we perceive love given and how we give love ourselves. And uh, if we were made by God, if, I believe we were. I believe we were created by the hand of God. I believe we're made in His image, in His likeness. Then human emotions are not an invention that came with creation. Human emotions are a reflection of the creator, not the creation. Do you understand that? So we feel like God feels. Why do you think we are such emotional beings? Do you think that just happened by accident. For some of you who've got screwed up theology, we need to have a long conversation that happened with the fall, whatever that is. No. We are imbibed with emotion because God is an emotional God. He's a God who feels things. So, so for me, it's very simple to say that all that we are being told here is that God's love language is faith. If you want to really speak to the heart of God, then faith is the way to do it. I don't believe worship or service are what touch the heart of God. Let me tell you for why. When you're great, and you know you're great, somebody telling you that you're great doesn't mean that much. It might mean a lot to the person who's telling you that you're great because they're needing to come to an understanding that you are great, but if you're already great, somebody telling you you're great doesn't do it, which is why the Bible doesn't say that without worship it's impossible to please God, or without praise it's impossible to please God, even though all of them have validity, it doesn't say without service it's impossible to please God, it says one thing, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In other words, very often we are trying to touch the heart of God with the wrong thing. See, mostly what happens when we gather together corporately and a certain kind of worship is the person who's being touched is us. But the Bible's very clear, without faith it's impossible to please God. God's heart is touched when we understand, live in, and express faith because he's pleased. There's something that gives him pleasure because in that process we believe he is who he said he is and that we are who he says that we are and something flows down that channel to us. So 
He can be pleased. Faith is the critical ingredient. So however it works, faith evidently then means something to God. Now, in the Bible, there's no debate about whether you have it or don't have it. Okay, that, that's, that's a human debate about whether you have faith or you don't have faith. The debate is never in Scripture about whether you have it or don't have it. It's about whether you're prepared to use it. Because even when Jesus said to the disciples, oh, you have little faith, he wasn't talking so much about the measure of their faith as he was about their unwillingness to use the measure that they had. Let me explain that again, because we, we, we're not here to have a, a two-hour thesis breakdown on this. That probably wouldn't help you anyway. 1 Peter 1 verse 7, here's what, here's what Peter writes. The most valuable commodity you have in your possession is faith. Here's what he says. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, listen to this, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. In other words, your faith is the most valuable commodity that you have. It's more valuable than gold. It can accomplish more than refined gold. It can change more things. Now, the problem is most of us don't believe that because we think, I'll tell you what, I could do a lot more if I had more money rather than I could accomplish a lot more if I would use my faith. And it says, so that your faith, listen to this, may be proved genuine, which must mean there is a kind of faith that's not genuine. It's counterfeit. It's all flash. It's all external. It's all outer. It's all clever words. It's all clever statements, but, but not genuine, and not genuine for some very specific reasons. I want genuine faith if I'm going to have faith. But I want you to understand that faith is the most valuable commodity that you have in your possession. When all of us start to grab that, we're going to start to see a lot more things start to shift. And I'll show you why, okay? So let me tell you how I have defined faith. And it's still my favorite definition at this moment. Which is that faith is the determined placement of belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God. Faith has got nothing to do with the power of God in its application. It experiences the power of God in its manifestation, but it's got nothing to do with the power of God in its application. We are not called to have faith in God's power. We are called to have faith in God's goodness and God's faithfulness because not every manifestation in our life is based in power, but it's all based in goodness and faithfulness that may require power, but power is not present in everything that happens, but goodness and faithfulness is. So my faith is not, oh, God is powerful, I need the power of God to do this. My faith is God is good, and God is faithful, and I believe that as I make a decision to place my belief and trust in his goodness and his faithfulness, that where power is needed, power will come forth, but whatever is needed will flow out of that. Even if it's wisdom, it might be wisdom. It might be revelation, it might be understanding. It might be love where you couldn't love. Kindness where you couldn't be kind. Flowing out of that, so my faith is not which I was sort of I'd told on some accounts but not told on others, but it always seemed to be that faith was all about the power of God. Faith and the power of God. I think some of that was more because we were insecure. The goodness, faithful, if you will determined to place your belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God, the other stuff will work itself out. So Matthew 17, 20. I tell you the truth. This is, I'm not going to read the first bit. I'll go from, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's a pretty powerful statement. 
on, on many fronts, particularly for the fact that they used the illustration of a mustard seed, which in essence was the smallest of the seeds, okay? So the smallest seed that you could find, if you have faith as small as that seed, the smallest kind of thing that they could physically get a hold of that had life in it, if you've got faith that size, then it can move a mountain. Now, evidently, it's not how much faith you have then, but what you do with the faith that you have that matters. Because mustard seed is not something that you say, here is my mustard seed of faith. You are meant to plant it. It's what you do with the seed that determines the power of the seed, not the size of the seed. So it's not the size of your faith, it's what you do with your faith that determines the harvest. So how much of our faith is planted... And remember what happens when you plant something, you bury it, you put it into the darkness of the ground, you begin to put it through a death resurrection process, it has to die in the ground. You don't keep digging it up to see how the seed's doing, because some of you know if you keep digging up the seed to see how the seed's doing, the seed's not going to be doing and it's not going to be able to do. Your faith is that in that seed is the power to produce what is necessary from that seed, and I plant it, and I believe, and I leave it, and I believe. Yeah, I might have to water it. I might have to water it with some, I believe that this is going to work, that this is God. I may have to water it, but I have to believe that that seed is going to do what that seed was designed to do. Faith is a seed. That seed is designed to do something. It's designed to grow it's designed to become much bigger than it ever was in the beginning and to produce a harvest. But it can only do that when it's sown. And we have to sow the seed. What is the seed? It's the belief and trust in the goodness of faithfulness of God in this situation, in that situation, for this need, for that need, for this healing, for that help. It has to be planted so that we are actually believing something and letting the seed do its work. Now... Uh, there's also the other thing, because there is another scripture that uses a mountain, you know, that, that if, you, if you believe, you know, and say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. Um, the issue is then, was he really suggesting moving the dirt of a literal mountain? Was that the point here of, oh, you know, mountain-moving faith, we're going to move this mountain from here to there? <clears throat> is it a literal thing about about getting rid of the dirt and moving the dirt somewhere? Or is it symbolic of the removal of the obstacle that the mountain represented? <coughs> Both of these stories were about specific mountains. The second one was actually, if you look at it, based in Jerusalem on what was known as Mount Zion. And what was interesting is that the psalm said that Mount Zion would never be removed, but Jesus is now talking to them and saying, if you have faith and you believe and you speak, this will be moved. You see, what he was driving at was not the literal moving of dirt, as in the physical mountains. The mountain was an analogy to talk about applied faith, and in each lesson, the lesson is the same. It's about what the mountain represented. See, the first thing that has to be shifted by our faith is all the stuff that we have accumulated that means something to us that are standing in the way of what needs to happen happening. The religious system of these two mountains which we could talk about was standing in the way of the miracle happening. It's really interesting that the thing mostly stood in the way of the miracle that was desired was a religious thing. A mountain, a system, a structure, a way of doing things was not building faith, it was opposing faith and that the moving of the mountain was you have to move the system that this mountain represents because it will tie you into a religious system that will not release your faith to do what God wants your faith to do. And so I'm going to bring this to a close. In each one, the lesson is the same. And there's three things I want to raise with you before we finish. Conversation and confession are two different things. Now stay with me. Discussion and declaration are two different things. <clears throat> and reasoning and faith are two different things. 
But here's the problem. We tend to focus on conversation, discussion, and reasoning to resolve the issues and move the mountains that we face. Rather than doing it by confession, declaration, and faith. Here's where I want to finish. Very simple point, but very important. Jesus didn't say, have a conversation with the mountain. He didn't say, have a discussion with what the mountain's looking for. He didn't say reason about how you can sort this out. He said, speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain and tell the mountain what the mountain is supposed to do. Now, I personally believe that the first thing we have to move on is faith. He's telling beliefs that we have accumulated that are standing in the way of a full revelation of the kingdom of God to get out of the way because we're not going to allow them to dominate us anymore. That's the most difficult thing you will ever face in life. It was for the Pharisees and teachers of the law. They could not tell their historic concepts of God, Bible, the Messiah, and the kingdom to get out of the way so that light could come through. They couldn't do it. So what they did was they put out the light. They got rid of the Jesus. The first thing all of us have to do is deal with the areas that are really doubt and unbelief about the true nature of God, what he's called us to, and how religion has got in the way of us so that as we move that, faith can actually do what faith needs to do. So the issue was, don't talk to the mountain. Don't have a discussion with the problem. You're not here to have a conversation with the issue that's going on or to try and reason it. The whole issue, when Jesus talked about faith, he didn't say, talk to the mountain. He he didn't say, talk with the mountain. Have a conversation with the problem. Have a conversation about the problem. He said, talk to the mountain. and Tell the mountain, mountain, you need to be moved and cast into the sea. You need to be moved from here to there because you are a barrier to my faith seeing what my faith needs to see and you need to move and get out of the way. The problem is in our own minds and lives we have conversations with the problems that we face. In the Old Testament it was David and the giant Goliath. The giant Goliath wanted to have a conversation But God said to David, you go and tell the giant, right? Here's what I'm going to do. He was to not have a conversation with the problem. He was to speak to the problem. And until we shift our focus from speaking, having a conversation with and about the problem to speaking to the problem, then the problem is not going to shift and cast itself into the sea. Now, again... There can be some who would think, well, you know, faith's a funny thing because we are so so wired towards fear and condemnation that if a thing doesn't work the way we thought it should work in the time that we thought it should happen, we immediately start to bring condemnation upon ourselves instead of leaving that to God and saying, do you know what? My faith was genuine. I believed in the goodness and the faithfulness of God and in the goodness and faithfulness of God. Sometimes things happen in that goodness and faithfulness that are wiser than what I would have decided I wanted to happen in that situation. We're going to leave those aside. They're the exceptions. But the problem is if we don't move into this arena, then nothing shifts, nothing moves. Our mountains remain where they are. Our problems stay the same. Nothing gets out of the way. And we are, we are condemned to a, a life of normality and reason rather than a life of faith and expectation where we see the supernatural power of God touching us. I want you to be in that realm. I want me to be in that realm. And I think God wants us to live in that realm as well. So what's your mountain? What's the mountain you're facing? Can you speak to it? Say, well, what if nothing happens? Or what if something does happen? What if something does happen? I'm still astounded that our neighbor Jane is just with us. Some aren't, but she is. So I'm glad we did what we did. And I'm glad that somehow within that connection, 
something happened. I have been a beneficiary of many of those miracles in my life. But you know, when we get in this area, our mind always wants to focus on what we think didn't happen rather than what we think could happen, the possibilities that are there for us to experience. I want us to start believing. I want us to start believing in another level. I want us to start putting our belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God to the extent where we say, do you know what? I'm going to speak to this mountain and I'm going to believe in the goodness and faithfulness of God and we are going to see what happens. Maybe the simpler we get, maybe the less religious we get, maybe the more Canaanite we become, maybe the more... Roman centurion, we become in our spirit. Maybe, maybe the same Jesus can look at us and say, I've not seen faith like this in a, in a long, long time. But that could be you and it could be me. And it can be your mountain, it can be my mountain. Because that same faith is available to all. You have the seed. You have the seed, small though it may be, the question is, what are you going to do with it? And are you going to be prepared to watch to see how that produces miracle in your life? Let's pray. Father, today, we just submit all that we've heard to you. We submit it to you, Holy Spirit, that you will put this deep inside of us and ingrain it with others. We, 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 we want to be people who, who are truly people of faith, people who... who and, and not just talking about what we could have figured out and reasoned out and how it could have worked, but people are coming and saying, this couldn't be figured and reasoned, but you know what? <clears throat> something incredible is happening, and something incredible has happening happened, and it has to be God. It couldn't be anything else. It, it's come from outside of me. It's come from outside of my situation. And somehow in this place, heaven and earth have collided, and what has happened is wonderful. Lord, that's my desire for everybody in here tonight. And I believe it's your desire for us. And I want you to be pleased. I want you to be pleased not because I think you are kinder if you're pleased because you're not unhappy. But I want you to be pleased because this love language of faith that you so desire in you, I want that to be what just flows out of us. So that your heart and spirit are blessed by us in the same way that you bless our heart and you bless our spirit by your presence. So I speak to the mountains of doubt. I speak to the mountain of unbelief. I speak to the mountains of shame and of failure, of intimidation. I speak to those mountains. I speak to those mountains of broken relationships and broken promises. I speak to the mountains of ill health and sicknesses that have no natural cure. I speak to the mountain of debt and lack. I speak to the mountains of lack of confidence and insecurity and self-doubt. I speak to those mountains right now. I command those mountains to be removed and cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Moved completely so that your light and your life shows through. So Father, we believe that you're with us. And as we've read in the book of Romans, what shall then we say then to these things? If God is for us, well, we take the if out. God, you're for us. So who can be against us? Let a spirit of faith, I pray, sweep through this place. Touch every heart and lift us to another level. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, believe, reach out, ask yourself the question, what is it in my life that actually the only way that this can happen is if faith is a reality, and begin to plant your seed right there, the place where you can't reason it, can't fix it, can't sort it, but that reality will be when that becomes a miracle. Are we believing for it? Are we reaching out for it? Are we also putting no condemnation on anybody? Yes? There's no condemnation because we're in Christ, okay? But what we are going to do is open every possibility for us to experience the fullness of the kingdom of God in reality 
in physical flesh in our lives right now. Okay, have a cup of coffee, hang around. We love you, and uh, don't forget Wednesday's the movie night. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>